Well, good morning, church. I've already been called Isaac once this morning. I'm not Isaac. And I'm also not Wesley Smith. I am his much better looking, much stronger, and much smarter younger brother. So are there any uh, folks here who are the last born in their family? Look around, folks. These are the best and the brightest right here. (laughs) So, yeah, all right. So whenever you need answers, now you know who to go to. So uh, thanks for letting me be here, of course. Uh, It's really kind of a cool deal to, to be here. I've heard lots of stories over the years about just different incredible things happening here. So it's fun to be here and be able to hang out with you guys. So I understand you're in a series the questions of Jesus, and so I listened to the first, I think maybe I've listened to all three, or is this like the fourth? So I think I've listened to all three, and I noticed that uh, Pastor Nate said that there were 307 questions that Jesus asked. Is that right? Am I getting my stats right? So this is going to be a really long series for you guys, apparently, so... (laughs) Uh, anyways, I, hopefully you make it through. Uh, I, you know, was, of course, thinking about this whole questions that Jesus asks and just, you know, kind of processing this a little bit as I knew I was going to be talking about this. And uh, one of the things that we know about Jesus' questions is he's not, he's not looking for like information from us, because he's God, he knows all things, but he's trying to provoke transformation in us, right? So he's not, he's not asking for an answer, really, because he already knows the answer. He is trying to bring awareness. He's trying to sort of wake us up to some sort of uh, reality that is going on. So, you know, as you read these, as you go through all these things, it's not God searching for information, He's trying to sort of poke at our hearts and invite us into the transformation that we need that is best for us. So hopefully you'll, you'll get a sense of that. Hopefully you're having a sense of that as you, as you go through. Uh, there's a really incredible dignity to God asking us questions. Do you know that? Like a really deep dignity to being asked a question by God, because what does that mean? It means we have the ability to process it, to think about it, and to respond to it. So there's an incredible dignity to it, but there's also this very weighty responsibility. A very weighty responsibility to being asked a question by God. Because he knows that we can answer it, that we can respond to it, that we can change. We can make a decision to change and be different. And so now, now there's some responsibility. This is the part where it gets scary for me. I don't know if it gets scary for you sometimes when you're reading the scriptures and you know that God is expecting you to respond. That gets very scary for me. And so oftentimes I just have to stop and pray and ask God to help me. So... I'm going to give you a chance to do that. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to give you a chance to just ask God to help you be able to respond to his question. So please bow your heads for a moment. Father, we want to be different. We want to be yours. We want to be your people. We want to respond well to your grace. We ask that you would help us do that now. Lord, that you would transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Well, there were a few different questions that I thought of talking about. Uh, One of my favorite questions that Jesus asks is to the Pharisees. He asks, have you ever read the scriptures? Oh man, every time I see that, I love that because of course they've read the scriptures. They've got the thing memorized. And so it's just the most sarcastic, like, I don't know, 
coolest thing Jesus says. Have you ever heard of, like, the Bible? There's a couple things in there I'd like to point out. Maybe you've, maybe you've never read it before. Uh, one of the questions that I really don't like is when Jesus says, how can you call me Lord, but not do what I say? Oh, I don't like that question at all. It's pretty much every time I read that question, something comes to mind. Ooh, I'm not doing that. Uh, need to make a course correction. But that's a really heavy question, so I'm going to leave that for Pastor Nathan maybe sometime later on. He can address that with you and dive deep into the disobedience that you are <laughs> committing. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, talk about one of the questions that reveals the heart of God. Because when we see the heart of God, we respond to that. And that is what transforms us when we get this glimpse of the heart of God for us. So that question is found in Luke chapter 15. And in the first few verses, uh, we're going to see that question pop up. You're probably familiar with the question, but Jesus asked in his sort of the beginning to a set of stories, he asked if a shepherd had a hundred sheep and one got lost, would that shepherd not leave the 99? So that's the question. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation and... Um, so there may be some variance depending on what you're reading, but it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners. I love that. These are well-known, right out in the open, flagrant sinners. Jesus is hanging out with these guys. So it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them, which was this sign of intimacy with somebody, like true friendship with somebody. And they were under strict directions from the Pharisees to be separate from anybody who did not honor God as they were defining it. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go and search for the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, or when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven. And this had to have been very disturbing for the Pharisees. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. This must have been a dagger right into their hearts. And they must have really disagreed with it in a vehement way internally. Because they had been pursuing righteousness so stringently over the course of their lives. And to have somebody suggest that God cared more about repentance than he did about righteousness. Something that would have popped into their minds as soon as Jesus brought up this analogy of shepherd and sheep would have been Exodus chapter 34. So if you want to turn there, you can. I think it'll be up here as well. But uh, remember, these, this audience that Jesus is addressing with this question, they have the Old Testament memorized. Uh, they, they play games like um, you know, to decide who's the greater rabbi, for example. Because there's a lot of competing rabbis. That's one of the reasons that people don't like Jesus is because Jesus is really, really sort of destroying their popularity because Jesus is 
rising and they are not. They are going down and down and down. And so they're having big problems with Jesus. But one of the things they would do as rabbis to sort of decide who is the best rabbi is one rabbi would ask another rabbi a question. That rabbi would respond with another question. And they would keep going back and forth until one rabbi had no answer. So you see throughout, throughout the scriptures that it's often at the end of one of Jesus' teachings or his discussions with these Pharisees, it says, and they were silent. Or, and they had no answer. And what that means is, Jesus is awesome. And he is the best rabbi. So when Jesus began this answer, or began asked the question and began telling this, or giving this example, showing this analogy, this passage would have immediately jumped into their minds because this is where God identifies the shepherd and the sheep and uses this analogy. This would have been incredibly familiar to them. So this is what it says. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. So now when, we're, when Jesus is telling his story, when he's giving his example, the Pharisees know immediately Jesus is talking about them. They are the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you shepherds who feed yourselves instead of your flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, butcher the best animals, but you let your flocks starve. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. So Jesus isn't just pulling this example out of thin air. Jesus has given this example before. Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. Doesn't he confront the Pharisees so many times? For the way in which they are leading. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd, and they are easy prey for any wild animal. They have wandered through all the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. Shepherd's responsibility, right? Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you abandoned my flock and left them to be attacked by every wild animal. And though you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep. When they were lost, you took care of yourselves and left your sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds my enemies, and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths. The sheep will no longer be their prey. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. Jesus tells them that there's more rejoicing in heaven, over one lost sinner who repents, than over 99 people who believe themselves to be righteous. Jesus declares repentance is so much more important than righteousness. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the good news before. That's the good news. Jesus cares more about repentance than he does righteousness. Why does he not care so much about our righteousness? Right, if you've been around church for a while, you know uh, we're not great standards of righteousness, are we? Even if we've been followers of Christ for some time, one of the things we realize is the purity and the holiness of Christ more and more and more. And even though we are living maybe a righteous life, we realize more and more deeply our desperate need for his righteousness. Jesus tells another story. 
to further uh, drive home his point. He says, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call on her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my, last, my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So the image here is of uh, perhaps an older woman who has been widowed and is left with her dowry, a small amount of money for her to uh, survive on. Uh, the cash equivalent for these 10 coins that she has been given would be like $1,600 in our day. Not much to live on. And imagine that she loses one-tenth then of her retirement account, which is very small. You can just sort of picture the passion with which she would have searched for that lost coin. I mean, that was life to her. And she needed it desperately, so she gets her broom out and she's sweeping the floor and hoping that coin will rattle between the cracks in the rock and the floor, wherever it's lost, so she can hear it and so she can find it. But she is desperately seeking to find this lost coin. And so the heart of the Father is revealed. He is desperate, desperate for a relationship. He is desperate for us to experience incredible, abundant life in him, true life in him. He is desperate for us to see the lies of the enemy, the deceit that is being, being brought on us again and again. He is desperate for that. He is searching for us. And he will continue searching because something is missing. We are missing from the family of God if we are lost and he will search for us. He's trying to invite these Pharisees to see the heart of God. Don't you understand what God is about, he's saying, in his stories and in his questions. And then, of course, you know, he goes into the story of the prodigal son and he tells this story of a son who completely offends his father in the most egregious ways and in their opinions he should have been you know stoned immediately for the offense that he that he or the way in which he offends his father but his father lets him go he lets him go into full rebellion he gives him free will he gives him money resources everything to go screw up his life in every way he wants to because his son has decided that he knows better than the father and his father says, go and see. Go and see. And his son tries it out. He tries it out. He seeks temporary pleasure. And we know the story, right? We know he gets to the point where he breaks. He gets to the point where his circumstances are so desperate that he has only one recourse, and that is to return to the Father. He knows, he's processed it, he's figured it out. My way just isn't working. This is not gonna, I'm, I'm done. And he decides to surrender himself to become hopefully a servant in his Father's house to enslave himself to the Father because he knows his Father at least will treat him well and when he returns, he gets the surprise of his lifetime. When his father sees him from far away, which means he has been watching diligently, he's been watching the horizon, he has been craving nothing more than the return of his lost son. When he sees him, he does something that old men in ancient Jewish culture did not do because it was shameful. He sprinted. He picked up his robe and ran as fast as he could toward his son because God does not care how far away from him we are. 
because he can cover any distance. So he does not care how far away from him we are. He only cares that we turn toward him. He only cares that we turn back toward him. But the story, of course, gets better and more disturbing if you're a Pharisee. Better if you're a notorious sinner, but disturbing if you're a Pharisee. I mean, it gets downright scandalous. I think there might be a song that talks about the scandalous love of Christ. And it's referring to this kind of thing because God, the Father, not only embraces his Son and welcomes him, but he commands that the robe of a son be brought to him. He commands that sandals be brought to him, separating him from the slave class. This is not a slave. This is my son. And he places the signet ring of the family on his finger immediately, welcoming him to return to have authority in the family to execute in the world. And the Pharisees have to have their minds blown. They are thinking blasphemy in 12 different directions at this point. No way is God that forgiving. No way is it possible that God would restore this rebellious son in such a manner. Then Jesus enters into the full invitation uh, to the Pharisees. You see, the notorious sinners, they already knew this about God. They already knew this about Jesus. This wasn't necessarily news to them because that's why they were hanging out with Jesus in the first place. And so Jesus' main audience here is the Pharisees. He's trying, trying desperately to get them to get on mission with God, to understand the heart of God and begin taking hold of her role as a shepherd and pursuing those who are lost. At the end of the story, it says the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. Right, the father had ordered a massive welcome home party. And the older brother, who has been the righteous person, he's done the right thing all of his life, he refuses to go to that party. And so Jesus has the Pharisees standing outside of the party. It says his father came out and begged him. Let me assure you that this would have never happened in ancient Jewish culture at the time of Jesus. Fathers did not beg their children. Fathers had the authority to have their children executed. Fathers had absolute authority in the home. They did not beg with their children. But Jesus is revealing the heart of God the Father, the patience of their father, if they would be willing His father came out and begged him. But he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. This is the older brother talking to the father. And in all that time, he never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Doesn't quite seem fair, does it? And Jesus recognizes that it doesn't quite seem fair. So he's giving the Pharisees this moment of reprieve. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and he has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. God is not dissatisfied with righteousness. God is not unhappy when we're obedient and do the right thing. 
Certainly, that is his ultimate desire for us because doing the right thing is the best thing for us and he wants the best thing for us. He's not trying to remove joy from us by inviting us to follow his ways. He's trying to increase our level of joy and abundance and the experience of real life. So he's not disappointed when people are righteous, when people try to get it right. But he is saying there's something that's more important. There's a bigger story at play. And it's when somebody repents. It's when somebody turns back. Oh, that's the thing that we are going to celebrate. That's the thing that I am after. And so, when Jesus asked this question... Of them, if a shepherd had 100 sheep and one went lost, wouldn't that shepherd leave the 99 and go and pursue the one who is lost? He is inviting all of us to get on mission with God, to devote our lives to pursuing those who are lost, to devote ourselves to sharing this incredible good news that we know, that we have experienced, that we have seen. So, there's one invitation here for any notorious sinners in the room. There's one invitation for those who, well, they know they're not righteous, They've tried things on their own. And they're starting to figure out, this really isn't working super well. I think there's a better path. And so Jesus invites you into the family. Jesus invites you to return, regardless of the distance you feel that there is between you and God. God will close that gap instantly. He will sprint in your direction to embrace you. That is his primary concern, that we return. And there is a second invitation for those of us who are in the church, those of us who have been redeemed. We are the righteous people of God. And that invitation is to join in the mission of the Father, to grasp the heart of the Father for people who do not know Him and to do everything we can in all that we do to share His good news with the people around us. So, if you would bow your heads, I'm going to pray that God would help us do that. Father, this is a world full of Difficulties and distractions. The enemy is constantly trying to get us to focus on those things. Focus on our own failures. Focus on what we perceive to be our inabilities. Father, we ask that you would help us focus on your incredible grace that you would help us see fully your heart of mercy for us, your desire to be in relationship with us and with our family members who don't know you and with our friends who don't know you and with our coworkers who don't know you or even our enemies who don't know you. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would anoint us to be ministers of reconciliation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.